This year, 2022, marks the 150th anniversary of the landmark 1872 Isle of Man Education Act for Public ed Elementary Education. So what did the Act do? Well, it introduced compulsory education for all, and it heralded the transfer of control of education away from the church and towards the state. It also paved the way for the abolition of school fees for all, improvements in the quantity and quality of teachers, and the gradual extension of the system of education that the island enjoys today. Now, nowadays, education for all children, regardless of class, gender, achievement, religion, ethnicity, caste or disability, is regarded by most people as a path to greater equality in society and as a human right. But it was not always so. So what I'm going to do this evening is frame my talk around four questions. I mean, the focus is this 1872 Act. Um, but if we want to know what the impact of the Act has been, we need to know what came before the Act. So what was the status of education before the 1872 Act? Secondly, how and why did the Act come about? Thirdly, who resisted the Act and who supported it? And finally, what impact did it have? So I'm going to address these questions in relation to the Isle of Man as a whole, um, but I'm also going to illustrate them um, with uh, information from the parish of Michael. So I hope I get the right balance for you between the island as a whole and Michael. So question one, who was the, uh, sorry, what was the status of education before the 1872 Act? Well, we have to go back um, in time and we have to start with the bishops. Because Bishop Barrow on the left here, he arrived on the island in 1663 and he wrote that the people, and that refers to most of us in this room, um, for the most part, the people were loose and vicious in their lives. <laughs> they were rude and barbarous in their behavior and they were without any true sense of religion. Now, Barrow wasn't here on the island for very long, but he had enormous <laughs> influence. <laughs> you didn't hear what I was going to say. He had, he had enormous influence because not only was he the bishop, but he was also the governor. And if you're bishop and governor, you have enormous power. But all credit to him, he set up the system of parish schools for all children, boys and girls. Sorry, I'm still laughing about, about, what, I, what, about what I said about not staying very long. He really didn't stay very long. But what he did when he, when he went back to England, and I believe he went back for reasons of ill health, um, he, he continued to exor exert enormous influence over the Stanleys, um, even from, I think he, he went back to Wales. Anyway, um, here in Kirk Michael, the parish school was established in 1668. And all the children in the parish schools were taught by the clergy. And they were taught through the medium of English. Uh, you can imagine how difficult that must have been because how many of those children, and indeed how many of the, of the, of the clergy, um, knew very much English. But Barrow persuaded the Earl of Derby um, who was the Lord of Man, to issue an order of enforcement. Now, tonight we're celebrating the 150 years of the 1872 Act, but the order of enforcement came in in 1672. So actually, we're also enjoying the 350 years of the 1672 order of enforcement. So just, just consider 350 years of glorious education. So under this enforcement, clergy were obliged to admit children who were too poor to pay any fees. They were obliged to admit them for free. Now, how many children were admitted to the parish schools for free back in the 1600s and the 1700s? We will never know. In the middle, you have Bishop Wilson. Now he took forward Barrow's work and he drew up another act or another act of enforcement. And this was an ecclesiastical Ecclesiastical Act in 1704. Again, this obliged all children to attend school. 
But what Wilson did also was that he moved teaching out of the churches. What Barrow had done was to establish schools inside the parish churches. But Wilson wasn't happy with this and he felt that having children in the churches um, didn't really show due respect for the church. So he had other buildings, uh, he had schools erected very close to the parish churches. Um, and he also, uh, he also appointed laypersons as teachers. So he replaced the clergy as teachers with the lay teachers. Um, and still education was delivered through the medium of English. And on the right, we have Bishop Hildersley. Now he succeeded Wilson and he made valiant but sh a short run attempt to have the children learn through the medium of the Manx language. Um, and in fact, in 1757, there was a survey conducted uh, led by Bishop Hildersley and it raised questions about the use of the Manx language in schools. Uh, the school teacher, um, sorry, the clergy who had to go to the school and answer this question um, asked, they, they asked, did the master or the mistress teach prayers and the catechism in Manx? And it turned out, and this is 1757, it turned out that across the island there were four of the teachers who had no Manx at all, including in Kirk Michael. Um, and the answer came back in this survey, the person who teaches our school in Kirk Michael is an English gentlewoman who does not understand Manx and can consequently cannot teach in that language. Now, despite the early legislation and the good intentions of these and subsequent bishops, the translation of the principle of education for all into practice faced many challenges and the goal of education for all was not achieved. So um, let's just explore a little bit the parish and ask what kind of schooling was available before 1872. So here is the old Kirk Michael School, but not the oldest Kirk Michael School. This school is still standing just down the road or up the road to the north. Um, and before this school was built in 1835, there was another school on this site. And before that, there would have been a school inside the parish church. So this is, if you like, the third version of the school. Um, and this building, as I said, was constructed in 1835 and it was later extended in 1878. But before this building was constructed in 1835, the school was already extended to incorporate two cottages. Now, Mike has very kindly shared this image with me. Um, this is actually an image of Patrick Kelly, who we'll talk about later. Um, but you can see there's a couple of, a pair of cottages here on the right. And um, Bishop Hildersley, uh, asked for these cottages, he gave the, provided the money for these cottages to be purchased. Um, and the idea was that one of the cottages would be a house for the schoolmaster and the other cottage would be accommodation for the schoolmistress and it would be used for the education of girls. So that's the, if you like, the extended uh, Kirk Michael School um, and that was extended in 1764. Of course, you've got several houses in between. The, the, the school is down here and the cottages are up here to the right. Okay, the next school in the Michael Parish, um, Bagaru, or what we, we call it Bagaru now, but I think at one time it was probably Bear Garu. Um, this is the Bear, uh, Bagaru Wesleyan School and this was established in 1842. And the school grew out of the Sunday School, which in turn grew out of the Wesleyan Chapel at Bagaru, and the Wesleyan Chapel was established in 1818. The Sunday School started in 1820 and then it became a day school in 1842. So we've got the, the Michael Parish School, we've got the extended Michael Parish School, we've got um, Bagaro. Then we can consider, although it's not exactly education for all, it's more like education for the few, but there was another layer of schooling 
um, on top of schooling for the common person, the ordinary person. And here we have Bishop's Court. Now, um, during Wilson's time, uh, he attracted around him a circle of young men who studied not only theology, but also logic, metaphysics, ethics, mathematics, and astronomy. The Bishop Wilson Theological College, which some of you will know about, that was only established much, much later in the 1880s. But when Wilson was the bishop, of course, there was the, um, the grammar school down in Castletown, and there was also the academic school uh, down in Castletown, which, for which Bishop w Wilson was responsible. Um, so he didn't institutionalize a school at Bishop's Court during his time, but he did gather this group of scholars around him. So we can regard it, if you like, as an informal school. And then there was the White House School for Girls. And I know that, Mike, for those of you who follow Facebook, and I'm not a great Facebook follower, but um, I know that Mike has been posting little snippets and tasters about education in the run-up to this, this talk. Um, and he's got a lovely uh, picture of the, uh, the back of the White House where the School for Girls was established. And we think it was established around 1760, and it was during Bishop Hildersley's Bishop Hildersley's time. And we think it was the first girls only school that, had, that was established on the island. And that was here in Kirk Michael. Then we have um, another school, which is known as the Bishop's, Bishop's Court School. And this was paid for by the niece of another bishop, Bishop Powys. And the niece was, uh, went by the name of Georgina Gore Curry. And she must have lived in Kirk Michael for a period of time. Um, she paid the salaries um, for, the, for the, uh, the, the school teacher, um, always a female teacher at this particular school. And this was both a day school and an Anglican Sunday school. And of course, that, that school is now a, uh, a, private, a private residence just up the road to the north. And then Georgina Gore Curry. Uh, also paid for Spoot Vane. Now, there's a lot of discussion about Spoot Vane. Again, um, thank you to Mike and indeed to, to, to James uh, from Culture Vannin for posting some very interesting information about Spoot Vane um, in recent weeks. It's, it's a little bit unclear whether it ever operated the day school. It was certainly a thriving Sunday school and a mission room in the later part of the century where students from the Bishop Wilson Theological College gained experience in teaching. However, I believe that the 1869 Ordnance Survey map refers to it as a school, and the 1869 Ordnance Survey map doesn't usually note Sunday schools, but it does note schools. And there's at least one legal conveyancing document um, which does refer to it as a school. So I think the jury's still out as to whether or not it ever functioned as a day school. A Sunday school it certainly was. But I'm including it here mainly to draw your attention to the role played by Sunday schools in education before 1872. Because for many children, the Sunday school was the only place where they had the opportunity to learn the rudiments of reading. And for a short period around the 1820s, some Sunday schools had access to spelling and storybooks in the Manx language. And these were suppri supplied by various religious organizations in London, in Liverpool, and in Bristol. The Methodists, of course, were particularly active in establishing Sunday schools. And I've already mentioned the Wesleyan Bagaru School, but there were several uh, Sunday schools here in Kirk Michael village. Um, there was a, I think, a primitive Methodist Sunday school um, to the north in Orisdale. I think I might have that right. Do correct me later if I haven't. And then to the south, I'm wondering um, where the Balakarnen Chapel is. Is Marilyn here this evening? No, no, okay. I was going to ask um, Marilyn whether the Balakarnen Chapel had a Sunday school attached to it. Um, it's, it's, it's likely that it probably did, but I, I, haven't, um, I haven't been able to establish that. So what we, what we have then in this period leading up to the 1872 Act is we have a patchwork of provision. And a very, very rough estimate 
um, that I've tried to conduct suggests that on any given day, maybe around 40% of children up to the age of 13 were in school, attending school. So, again, thanks to Mike for providing this list for me. And this is a, a fascinating list with all the names of the, um, the teachers from 1668 when the school was established. And Mike, I've put a space here between the four reverends and the teachers that follow. And I've done that to indicate that in the period of Bishop Barrow, the teachers were in fact the reverends, they were the clergymen. And then when Bishop Wilson came in 1696, he stopped all of that and lay persons became the teachers. Um, and you can see that over a very, very long period of time, there's really only a handful of teachers that have been. Um, you see the last, the last two persons, um, we've got a question mark about Judith Kelly here, um, and then Patrick Kelly, each in the school for 52 or 54 uh, years. Robert, I don't know whether you really would have fancied being a teacher for 52 or 54 years, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I, that, that, that I would. But it's a remarkable story, really, a fantastic period of time and really only a very small number of highly dedicated teachers. Um, the English gentlewoman, whose name we don't know, uh, but here she is. Uh, she features in Hil Bishop Hildersley's 1757 um, survey. Okay, so I've said a little bit about the patchwork of educational provision in the lead up to 1872, but what else was going on in the island in the run up to the act? Well, the period between 1830 and 1869 has been described as the island's onset of modernity. So here we go. There was growth in fishing, in mining, and farming, albeit fluctuating growth. And the first regular steamship service between Douglas and Liverpool was established. There was increasing agricultural mechanization um, and Messrs. Kelly and Corlett of Kirk Michael played an extremely important role in the manufacture of farm machinery. Um, there was a lot of exploration of minerals um, in what became the Kirk Michael mines uh, towards the end of this period. And of course, as we all know, mass tourism on the island took off from the 1860s, attracting thousands of English speaking visitors from the northwest of England. There were also significant economic developments across the water and across even more water on the European continent. It was the eve of the second industrial revolution and the emergence of the German Empire, which was formed in 1871, as a rival to Britain's industrial preeminence. There was a growing awareness in England that publicly funded compulsory education may have contributed to Germany's rapid industrial catch up. Up until that time, education in England was not compulsory and was driven by private initiative and the church. In Prussia and Saxony, by contrast, education had been compulsory for a long period of time and it was provided by government. So economic imperatives were beginning to change public opinion about the need for the public provision of education. There was also growing political, uh, sorry, there was also growing public opinion about the need for political change back here on the island. And the Manx Press, especially the Mona's Herald, led by Robert Farga on the left here, uh, and then later uh, by James Brown, uh, who, uh, who bought the Isle of Man Times. They were both agitating uh, over a long period of time for political and education reform. Indeed, the Isle of Man Times printed a report from the Society of Arts, which was a society based in London. Um, and in this report, countries were divided into four categories. In the first category were those most advanced in their education and it included Saxony, Switzerland, Denmark, Prussia, Sweden. England appeared in the second category, 
and the status of education in England at this time was described as education mixed with ignorance. Italy appeared in the third category with a sharp division drawn between the north of Italy and the south of Italy, and Turkey and Russia appeared in the fourth category. So that's just a little bit about economic development and political developments that were going on on the, on the island in this run-up to the 1872 Act. So who arrived on the island in 1863? Any ideas? Who might have arrived on the island in 1863? I'll give you a clue. He was a man. He was young. He was energetic. He was a modernizer. He was a reformer. He was a Scot with a colourful military background, and he has a promenade named after him. <laughs> Locke. Okay. So, in 1863, Governor Henry Locke, this young, energetic, modernising reformer, who has been described as one of the greatest administrators in the island's history, arrived. And the most pressing uh, issue that Locke faced on his arrival was the long-standing demand for electoral reform of the House of Keys. Because up until this point, MHKs were self-appointed and they held office for life. They were the large landowners and they were the merchants. And petitions for more representative elections to the House had fallen on deaf ears. But change did come and it came in 1865. So what was it, do you think, that eventually prompted this change. It was the weather. <laughs> a fierce storm in 1864 damaged the breakwater, the Douglas Breakwater, and a new one was in the process of being built to a design by the engineer named Abernethy. So on the left you can see Abernethy's breakwater and it was known uh, as the birdcage, because it looks a little bit like a birdcage. Um, but another fierce storm in 1865 demolished the new work here. Now these two images are taken in opposite directions. This one, you can see the Tower of Refuge here on the right, so we're looking into the bay um, ac across to Douglas Prom. It hadn't been named Loch Promenade by then. Um, but on the right, we're looking out, you can see the, the, the hills up here going um, to the north towards Laxey. And you here you can see the damaged uh, Douglas breakwater. Now, a solid breakwater was essential for the improvement of the harbour area and for trade and transport links with England, not least for the safe landing of the growing numbers of revenue generating summertime tourists. But Locke had no control over the funds necessary for the rebuilding of the Douglas Breakwater, so he entered negotiations with the British government. And what happened was that the Keys became a democratically elected body for the first time in 1867. The island's government gained greater control over its surplus revenue, and customs duties were increased, and the new breakwater was built. Now, you might be thinking, well, what on earth has the weather and the Douglas Breakwater got to do with education? Well, I would suggest that this greater control over surplus revenue would have given Locke the confidence to propose a reform of education for all the island's children that would be partly funded by government. Now, the justification for an expansion of education lay partly in concerns about the growth in crime. This was certainly a concern across the water in England, but it was becoming also an increasing concern in the densely populated area of Douglas. And this extract from one of the newspapers sums it up nicely. Do we have more schoolmasters and fewer policemen or more policemen and fewer schoolmasters. Schoolmasters, it is true, are not quite as demonstrable or quite as ornamental as policemen. <laughs> they are more useful, however, as conservators of public peace and property. And then there was the issue of teacher salaries. 
teacher salaries were very low and they'd been very low since Bishop Wilson's time. And I found in the Mona's Herald, dated 13th of January, 1869, a letter written by the Kirk Michael parochial schoolmaster. He didn't sign his name, but it must be Patrick Kelly. He said, the, the public cannot and ought not to expect to engage and employ the services of men of superlative attainments for the tuition of the rising generation at a less rate than any go-ahead farmer would willingly pay to a fair average ploughman. The tonsured gentleman of the long robe would not call forth the startling exhibition of the highest efforts of their wondrous eloquence and forensic skill if paid only with a puny fee that had prevailed a hundred years since. And yet, it is expected by some that the village schoolmaster should be willing and thoroughly capable of instilling into the diffused minds of the little bipeds that are, <laughs> <laughs> that are massed around him the essential germs of a superior education. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to delve into any of these old newspapers from uh, this period of time, I really would recommend that you do so. They're available in the um, Manx Museum Library, but they're also available in the I archive. So, um, and it's quite, it, it's completely free um, to access uh, that archive nowadays. And uh, so if you, if you have computer skills and you, you're faced with a very stormy, wet, grey afternoon. Just dig into some of those, those old newspapers, particularly the Mona's Herald and the Isle of Man Times, but also the Sun. Um, the language that is used in the letters page and indeed in the editorials is absolutely fantastic. It's very, very florid and people put things in a way that the Isle of Man press these days I think wouldn't dare to. Um, it's a very, very tame press that we have by comparison. So anyway, we, so we've had Patrick Kelly. We'll be hearing more from the newspapers in a moment. Um, so Locke decided to introduce the idea of an education bill late in 1869. And he said that the bill's objective is the removal of the causes of crime. And the MHKs applauded loudly. Crime is frequently the result of ignorance and it would confer infinite credit upon the legislature of the Isle of Man if the island was the first in which a large, broad and comprehensive system of education were to be introduced. More applause. Education should be placed within reach of every child in the island, however poor, however humble his lot may be, and that the blessings of education should not be confined to the few privileged classes. Now, note what we say, I've, I've highlighted it here. It would confer infinite credit if the Isle of Man was the first in which a large, broad and comprehensive system of education were to be introduced. Because what was going on at this time in England, there was um, a very, very lively debate about education for all. Um, and in Scotland too. And these three debates uh, were going on among educators and politicians. Um, in, 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 in parallel, really, I and mean, they were influencing each other, no doubt. But Locke wanted to be the first. And I think he thought he was going to have a fairly easy ride through the House of Keys with this bill. And the bill had these elements. Um, the, the, there would be a, a central education board and schools would be managed by 21 school committees. And the school committees would be chaired by the vicar, the church wardens and four elected parishioners. Religious instruction would follow the doctrine and the discipline of the Church of England. All teachers would be appointed by the school committees. Now, there are 21 of these, 17 parishes and four towns. Some school committees only had responsibility for maybe two or three schools. Others had responsibility for six, seven, eight schools. It was um, local management um, where the school committees were responsible for just about everything uh, from appointing teachers to mending windows that were broken and to finding sites for new school buildings. 
Um, but the teachers had to be certified by something called the Committee of Council, which was um, an English committee. Um, salaries were to be fixed at not less than £50 for a master and not less than £20 for a mistress. <coughs> now, just to, give you, just to give you some sense of comparison here, in today's money, £50 would be worth about £6,000. £20 would be worth, in today's money, about £2,400. It's not very much. And teachers at this time were earning less than that. Now, this was the draft bill. And the bill would then take more than two years to eventually pass through the House and eventually become law. There was much resistance to it, and there, was, there were many modifications of its clauses on the way. Now, here's a few headlines. Um, so we've moved now to our third main question. Uh, who resisted the passage of the bill and who supported it? Well, don't, don't screw your eyes up trying to read the text here, but you can probably read some of the headlines. Petitions against the education bill. The farmer's petition. The working man and the education bill. So we'll start with the farmers' petition. The Isle of Man Farmers Club submitted a petition to the House of Keys, and among other things, they suggested that children aged 9 to 12 should not be compelled to attend school all year round, and that the children should be liberated at such periods as they may be most useful for agricultural and other purposes. They also said that four years of age was too young for children to be made to attend school compulsorily. And they suggested instead that the start of compulsory education should be six years, with attendance between four years and six years uh, being made optional. So they didn't reject the idea of compulsory education out of hand, but they, um, and it's a very, very well worded petition. It's been very well thought through and it's, it's very beautifully written. Um, and so, but they, they, were, they were seeking to make amendments uh, to this bill, but of course they were amendments which were in their own interests. And the Mona's Herald in the editorial was very quick to congratulate the Farmers Club on having moved beyond their more usual discussions about thinning turnips. <laughs> Now, another letter to the press commented, educate the people and I venture to say that the country will be irretrievably ruined. <laughs> educate the people and you may as well emigrate at once. I ask the House of Keys to avert such an evil and I implore all ministers of religion to preach a crusade against this iniquitous measure. And I'm not sure where the iniquity is thought to lie here except perhaps against the farmers who are going to have difficulty um, gaining ready access to child labour. In the, in the House itself, um, the arguments went to and fro, and one of the MHKs in fact said, well, compulsion, especially during seed time and harvest, would pauperise a large class of inhabitants. And there was a lot of support for that particular view. Somebody else said, compulsion has not been mandated in England, Sorry, compulsion has not been mandated in England, so why should it be here? On the other hand, of course, there were the supporters. And the supporters, um, I'm sorry. Uh, the supporters uh, of, of, of the bill um, became more vocal. Where, where, when the bill was first uh, printed in the newspaper, and I should say again about the newspapers, it doesn't happen these days, the entire bill in all its 72 clauses were printed in the newspaper. Um, there was no Hansard at that time, and the only way uh, that people could get access to any of the legal uh, content and procedures was through the, these newspapers. I mean, you could buy, I think you could buy a copy of the Mona's Herald or the Isle of Man Times, and it would, it would last you for a month. I and mean, there's so many, many pages in there. And it didn't just, rec it just didn't report about what was going on 
in the Kirk Michael Parish Church or the, um, the Ebenezer Hall, although the Ebenezer Hall might not have been built in 1872, but you know what I mean. It was, it was actually reporting on world affairs and what was going on in Prussia, what was going on in Saxony, and occasionally even what was going on in Japan. Now, the supporters of the bill, um, again, there were many churchmen uh, who were supporters, and I think it was the Reverend Christian from Lazare who was the main uh, MHK churchman who, who supported the bill. Um, and I don't know whether this is him or not, but he, whoever it was signed himself as a churchman and he was writing from the parish of Lazare, and he urged the passing of the bill into law as soon as possible. He said the number of children who are growing up without an opportunity of receiving a fair education is simply startling. And then somebody who signed himself as a friend of the working man cautioned against dropping the compulsory clause. He said, let the working men of Laxey band themselves together to promote the good cause. Dangers are threatening a bill which would secure to us this priceless boon. And unless some very energetic measures be immediately adopted, most assuredly the compulsory clause, because it is objectionable to a few property holders, will be expunged. Working men forwards and laxy forever. So ultimately, on this area of compulsory, uh, uh, the, the clauses to do with compulsory education, the Keys agreed that attendance would be compulsory for those aged 7 to 13 for 150 days in the year. Children between the ages of 10 and 13 could be exempted uh, from school on condition that they achieved um, a certain level of education prescribed and examined by one of Her Majesty's inspectors. So let's move on then. That was compulsory education. There were many, many clauses and a huge amount of resistance to the clauses on religion. Because Governor Locke, uh, when he first introduced the bill uh, verbally, he had said that education uh, would preserve freedom in matters of religion. But the draft bill, when it was published in the press, asserted that it would be the Anglican doctrine that would be the basis of the schools. And more than that, the control of the schools would lie with the parish school committees, which comprised the local vicar, the church wardens, and four members elected at a church vestry meeting. Now, it wasn't long before voices were heard in the press. Somebody wrote, what on earth should have induced the Lieutenant Governor to suppose that four-fifths of the inhabitants would receive what four-fifths of the inhabitants don't believe. Verily, the governor must think that the dwellers in Mona have singularly soft heads, something akin to boiled turnips. <laughs> so you see this turnip metaphor, which is being used quite a lot. So there was an, a huge amount of to and fro on this, but ultimately the teaching of a particular religious doctrine was ruled out with a general acceptance among all the different religious groups that Bible teaching uh, would be delivered by the teacher, not by the clergyman. And that, uh, so Bible teaching would be um, uh, permitted. And the school committees uh, would be elected by the ratepayers and who in turn would elect their own chairman. Now that didn't rule out the vicar being elected the vicar could stand for election, the church wardens could stand for election, but they had to be elected. They could not be appointed um, by, by um, either the church or by government. And then the third area of debate, considerable debate, um, was the rates, the local taxes. Now, as the bill made its way through government, it looked as though it would be passed and suddenly there were many voices being raised about the rates. Ratepayers in the town areas questioned why they should subsidise education in the country areas where rich farmers paid low, low wages. There was a retort from the gentlemen of Mackled. And they said, oh, they, they signed themselves off actually as influential gentlemen in the parish of Mackled. <laughs> They said, the people of this island cannot possibly afford to pay rates to carry out every newfangled scheme. Gentlemen, 
the high rate of wages and the low price of corn is sufficient to cause us to reflect before we consent to another burden. Now, when they refer to another burden, they're referring to the rates that had been applied just a few years earlier to raise funds for the building of what was then called the Lunatic Asylum. And the funding for the Lunatic Asylum um, was raised through local taxes on property owners. The Mona's Herald actually went further in this um, long drawn out debate about taxes and what the, what the size of the local tax should be. They suggested that if the bishop was to sacrifice his heavy salary of £3,000 per annum. Now, remember what I said about the teacher's salary being 50 and being equivalent to 6,000. Well, 3,000 per annum is equivalent to 385,000 pounds in today's money. So you see the enormous sort of gap in, in income levels between certain important people um, in the delivery of education. So the Mona's Herald uh, suggested that if the bishop was to sacrifice his salary, then the burden of, on local rates would be reduced. However, the only way to secure this money and to secure lower rates would be to disestablish the church, which even the Mona's Herald acknowledged was unlikely to happen on the Isle of Man. So ultimately, it was agreed that the education rate would be, le would be level, uh, levied. Okay, so let's move on now to um, our fourth question. So what impact did the Act have? It was passed and it was promulgated um, at Tynwald in 1872. Well, the first thing that happened was that the school committees were established. This happened very quickly. Promulgation of the Act was on July the 5th. And already before the end of July, there were advertisements in the newspaper asking for uh, nominations to the school committees and indicating when and where the elections would actually take place. Uh, once these committees were established, um, the Central Board of Education then invited the school committees to consult with the schools and to apply to have the school transferred uh, from the church to state control. Now, this was a voluntary transfer. It wasn't a compulsory transfer. Unlike in the Scottish Act, I mean, the Scottish Act eventually, well, it preceded the Isle of Man Act by a few months, but it, it was passed in 1872. And in the Scottish Act, there was compulsory transfer of the schools uh, from the Church of Scotland control to state control. Um, so uh, in terms of transfers, the very first school to apply for a transfer was Bagaru across the whole island. Um, and the Michael School was the eighth in the island to apply. Um, it's interesting here, if you note the spelling, this is the spelling of Bagaru uh, in the first report of the Board of Education, which was published in 1873. Now, spelling is spelling, and the same Manx words will be spelt in many different ways. And um, I think most of us are aware that Bagaru is derived from Bear Garu. But of course, Bear, B A A R E, also means summit or apex. And having walked to the summit of your Sartfell last year and found a very flat and very rough and very stony summit, I'm just wondering whether there might have been another meaning to the name of Bagaru. So Bear Garu, the rough road, which I think most of us feel is the origin of Bagaru, um, or could it mean, could it also mean the stony summit? I'm not sure. Anyway, that's, that's by the by. So the Michael Elementary School, uh, the transfer of control from the church to the state was approved in 1878. And there was in 1878, a building grant awarded for an extension. And that extension was undertaken by the builder, Mr. Corlett. And again, uh, Mike did put out on Facebook just a few days ago, I think it's an entry from the school logbook um, indicating um, Mr. Corlett's uh, work. But that was an extension to the, to the building down the road. Um, and it was some time later, uh, almost 20 years later, that a more substantial grant was awarded. And then the new school, which is still the present school, uh, was opened in 1894. 
The plaque is here at the top. You probably can't read it. And I'm sorry, sorry that in my haste to, take, to make sure that I got the plaque in the picture, um, I, I missed out the apex of the, of the gable. But that is a very familiar site. And um, that school is still standing. And of course, as we all know, has been massively extended. So what was going on inside schools at this time, inside a Victorian school? Well, you might recognize a few of these um, images. The abacus, maybe, the blackboard, the dip pen and ink, the chalk and slate, the desk, the cane, mm, Dunce's hat. I mean, we all know about Dunce's, hat, Dunce's hats in cartoons from our generation, um, but perhaps they were being used. School bell, of course. There were two items here that puzzled me. One was the back straightener. Imagine what the children had to do was to raise their shoulders put their arms behind a flat board and sit like this to straighten their backs and sit up properly in class. And the other item that puzzled me were the finger stocks. Any idea what the finger stocks were used for? Well, I actually showed this slide. I showed this slide uh, two weeks ago down at the um, a talk I gave for the Russian Heritage Trust. And um, somebody was busy, didn't know about the finger stocks, and nobody knew about the finger stocks, but they Googled it. And the answer was the finger stocks were there to stop the children fidgeting and poking their noses. <laughs> OK, now this image, this is not a Kurt Michael image. This is actually one from the Russian boys' school, but I'm showing it to you because I just want you to look at these boys on the front row, sitting there with their arms behind their backs, and I'm kind of feeling that they might have had a bit of the back straightener um, treatment. But I, I know that from this period, this is 1900 actually, uh, there will be very many similar pictures that, that, that you will have shown in your, your display a few years back here. But this is um, Mr. Cubbon, the head teacher. Oh, Mr. Cubbon, yes. <laughs> I don't think he is a rela relation of ours at all. But um, William Cubbon, uh, who was the, the head for many, many years at the Russian Parish School for Boys, look how smartly he's dressed and, and the hat and the moustache, the, pound, the yeah. bow tie, on and on 50 pound, <laughs> well, yes, on 50 pound a year, absolutely. And, and it's beautifully, Pope uh, posed this, this, this photograph. You see the plant here uh, on the right. And Okay. So this is a rather nice image. And I'm not sure if it's of children going to school or children going home from school. But they do look quite happy, so I suspect they're going home uh, back to their farm. But I'm showing that really to raise the question um, of attendance, because after the Education Act was passed, um, the inspectors continued to come across from England. Um, and a, a theme of constant concern, uh, which they reported back to government, to Governor Locke, um, was that of attendance. They said that children's attendance levels were very, very poor. Um, and there are many reasons for poor attendance, which I'm sure you can imagine. And I'm going to briefly share uh, some extracts from Kronkavoda. Now, I know that Kronkavoda is not strictly part of Kirk Michael Parish, but it's not far down the road. And indeed, when the Bagaro School, oh, I forgot to say that the Bagaro School was the first school to be transferred. It was offered a building grant by the Board of Education, but the school committee um, didn't take the Board of Education up on the grant and the Bagaro School was closed. And the recommendation was that the children from the Bagaro School should go south across the border uh, and attend the Kronkavodi School, which, of course, if you were living south of Bagaro, made sense. Um, I love these images. In this one, you see the, uh, you see the, 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 the girls lined up on the, the left as we look at them, the boys lined up on the right. This is the school hall. And then next to it is the schoolmaster's house. Um, and I couldn't resist putting up this one, which also shows um, in the distance 
the, the, um, the, the Kronkevorde school, but it also shows the chapel um, at Kronkevorde. And this picture is taken in 1904, and it's the Gordon Bennett uh, road races. And I just love this because just look at the finery. Um, again, fifty pound a year. Um, just, just look what, at what people, how people are dressed, um, the hats and the, the beautiful finery. Um, but the main purpose of this is um, to draw your attention to Kronkavody, and just to share with you a few extracts from the Kronkavody School logbook. 1873, February the second. A few children are missing. Picking turnips. <laughs> April the first. A great many children are missing, picking turnips. <laughs> April the 27th, a great many children are missing, setting potatoes and picking stones. June the 19th, many children are missing, they have the chin cough, and chin cough was whooping cough. Um, 1877, Dr. Higgins, the public vac vaccinator, attended and 38 children were vaccinated. November the 16th, uh, one week later, many children were absent. Parents are blaming the vaccination. <laughs> and the final extract from the logbook that I'll share with you is from 1882. Uh, and this is a, a, an entry in the logbook written by the schoolmaster. Attendance is not so good as it ought to be. If I did not make special efforts myself and appeal to the parents by word of mouth and notes, our attendance record would be far from satisfactory. Our attendance officers are no better than two old women. <laughs> Don't quite know what was meant by that, but okay. Okay, so we've had lots of words and we've had lots of images. So let's, have some, let's now have some numbers. So what I'm trying to do in this graph is to show you over a period of 30 years, growth in the school attendance figures. Now these are average daily attendance figures and they range from uh, the records that we have um, in the Board of Education reports from 1871 all the way through to 1901. You can see in this blue line, there's a gradual, it is only a gradual rise in attendance the number of children likely to be at school across the whole island on any uh, average day. Now, these uh, four uh, brown uh, columns represent the population of the island at the four population censuses, 1871, 81, 91, and 90, 1901. Now, I've divided these by 10 in each case simply so that I can present them on the same graph as the school attendance figures. And what's interesting here is that the population of the island is hardly changing at all. It's certainly not growing, and it, nor is it declining. But the uh, numbers of children attending school each day is gradually going up and up and up. Now, the 1872 Act um, put in place a framework and a structure from which other amendments to the Act could fairly easily be made. And in 1884, it was decided that these local attendance officers who were supposed to be appointed by the school committee, it was felt that they weren't really doing their work very well and that the Board of Educated ne Education needed six attendance officers appointed by the board and based in Douglas and who would go out and travel around all the schools in order to try and improve attendance. Uh, by the 1890s, then, all fees were abolished for all children and the school leaving age was raised from 13 to 14. So what was going on in the Michael Parish over the same period of time? Now, these are the Michael figures in brown going up and up. They're fluctuating a lot. But interestingly, the green line, the dotted line, this is the population of the Michael Parish going down and down and down. What I've done here is I've just taken the four um, population census figures and I've smoothed them off. But in Michael Parish um, is experiencing a decline in population. Nonetheless, the children's attendance is going up. So I think we can be fairly assured that something was going on in education and that there was some impact of the 1872 Act on long-term enrolment. Now, you might be wondering why there's a flat line down here, 
between 1871 and 1874. And that's because Mr. Kelly, uh, the headmaster, didn't make any returns during those four years. Um, for, for whatever reason, it may be that he was still angry and still angling uh, for a, a big raise in his um, salary. But he was uh, nearing retirement. Um, he must have been quite an old man uh, by this stage. OK, so we're, uh, we're coming to the end of the story now. Um, and we can say that um, from now on, from the uh, early 20th century, we began to see the system of education expanding and we also began to see diversification within the system. So in 1920, um, the school committees basically had a 48 year run, but there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the way that they were going about their job. And um, government at that time decided to abolish all the school committees and create one central, uh, it was called the Isle of Man Education Authority. Um, and there was also the establishment of, um, in predating 1920s, it was actually the 1907 Higher Education Act. Now, higher education in those days didn't mean what we mean by higher education today. Higher education meant beyond elementary. It went beyond the age of 14. And there were various experiments with um, different kinds of, of additional classes added on to elementary schools. The Douglas High School, of course, was um, already established in 1894, I think. Um, and so there was a lot of experimentation um, going on on the island at that time. In the 1940s, of course, and again ahead of England, um, comprehensive secondary schools were established post-11 in Douglas and Ramsey, and that must have had some impact on some of the children, at least here in the Kirk Michael Parish, who I imagine uh, would have been going to Douglas, um, probably to Douglas, uh, on the train uh, for their post-11 education. In the meantime, um, uh, the other children were uh, uh, st staying, uh, staying back in the um, elementary schools. However, then in the 1970s, we see uh, a lot of population growth on the island. We see a number of primary school extensions. We see new schools. And finally, we have a comprehensive secondary school for the west of the island. Um, the south got its comprehensive school uh, before the west. Um, and I know that at least that there is at least one teacher uh, in the room who I think was there from the very beginning in 1979. Um, then, of course, there were the extensions to the Kirk Michael School, and these extensions started in the 1990s, and they've continued with the recently constructed uh, New Hall and other extensions. And then finally, I'm going to mention the Bund School Gilgak, because although this is not located in the parish, Entry to the Bund School is island-wide entry. So there are uh, children from the Kirk Michael Parish who have been and who are currently um, enrolled in the Bund School. And of course, this school, which used to be the St. John's um, School, the old St. John's School, um, the, the Bund School Gilgak was uh, formally opened in 2002 and is celebrating its 20th anniversary uh, this year. Um, and of course, the medium of instruction is Manx. And I think Bishop Hildesley would have been pleased. So just to round up, I've come to the end of my talk. Um, I just want to draw your attention to uh, further resources in case any of you really want to delve into this um, further. Uh, Culture Vannon has very kindly uh, created a page on its website called 150 Years of Education for All, and there's a number of resources on that site. Um, among those resources is a lovely document which Joe Collister has, has produced uh, for use um, in the schools. What it is, it's a collection of these newspaper articles. I've only been able to give you a few extracts from the articles, but uh, Joe has included much longer extracts from those articles. Um, these have been provided to the schools um, for history work or social studies work, but uh, we've also uploaded them onto the Culture Vannon site so anybody can use them. 
and Joe has kindly brought some leftover uh, newspapers, uh, so, and they're on the table. So if any of you want to take these away, either for yourselves or for your children or your grandchildren, uh, please do so at the end of the, of the day. And uh, there's also on the Culture Van Insight um, a long working paper, and it is a working paper that I've written uh, on this topic. Um, and I, I would be very, very um, welcome for any comments uh, that you might like to make uh, to that paper because it's not been published officially anywhere yet. And then finally, I would just draw attention to uh, some other resources. There are some very good books around uh, on the island um, uh, that, that, that provide fabulous information about education in different parts of the island. Hinton Bird's two-volume uh, book, An Island That Led, The History of Manx Education. Then Mike Hoy's two, 2010 book, Bishop Barrow, His Life and Legacy. And then Ronald Ely's book, 2003, with some beautiful pen and ink uh, drawings of, of old um, schools. Uh, the book is called Manx Schools Past present and proposed. So, Gurumayo as thank you very much indeed. <laughs>